you, you do know in September, like, like all of that's coming down. So just, it's, September's going to be an interesting month and other stuff's going up. So we're going to be a construction zone, a good kind of construction zone to the glory of God. Okay, I'm going to show you, I'm just going to start right off and just show you the clip to the movie here. I'm going to hit these back lights here. Um, I'm going to let the trailer speak for itself. If for any reason, I haven't seen it projected up there, if, if you need to turn around and look at the TV up in the crow's nest, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, if it doesn't look like you can see anything. Okay. Yeah, that, that will be fixed soon, too. So here's the trailer to the movie I'm alluding to today. Miramax Home Entertainment is proud to present an extraordinary new movie. Nominated for seven Academy Awards, including Best Director, Best Actor, Best Screenplay, and only the second film ever nominated for both Best Picture and Best Foreign Film. Meet a real-life Prince Charming. He has met the woman of his dreams, and he'll do everything in his power to sweep her off her feet and carry her away. Now, his fairy tale life takes a serious turn. To protect his family, this loving father has to turn the hard truth into a simple game. <laughs> Wonderful. Two thumbs up, says Siskel and Ebert. A modern comic masterpiece, raves the Chicago Tribune. Written, directed by, and starring Italy's national treasure, Roberto Benigni, in the story that proves love, family, and imagination conquer all. Life is beautiful. Uh, it's one of my favorite movies. Um, received several Academy Awards back in, came out in 98. Uh, best actor, Robert Benigni. Roberto Benigni, excuse me. Uh, it's, a, it's in Italian. So you have, yeah, yeah. And, uh, go figure. And uh, so you have English subtitles. And I think that's why a lot of people don't see it. We get really lazy when we watch movies. Yes, you're going to have to read the subtitles if you come on Friday night at 8 o'clock to see the movie. But I can tell you, it is well worth watching. Um, the movie itself, it starts off as this love, sweet love story between Guido and this woman whose heart he's trying to win. Her name is Dora. They get married and they have a son. Okay. But Guido is a Jew living in fascist Italy. Okay. It's 1945, the waning days of World War II. And the Jews are under constant pressure right now. Uh, constant persecution. And without public warning, without any kind of warning, uh, the police show up at Guido's home and they take he and his entire family into custody. Okay. They're herded like cattle onto a train to a concentration camp. A place of horror and a place of death. And men and women at this camp, they work all day melting down metals that would be turned into weapons. The old and the weak and the sick are sent to the showers. Guido, out of his love to protect the heart of his little five-year-old child, Joshua, he does everything he can to keep Joshua from the horror that is all around him. And he convinces his son that it's all a game of hide and seek and make-believe and they make up a game called No Talking. And it's like in the movie, the son is living in one world and everyone else is living in another. A father is determined to have his five-year-old boy know within his heart that ultimately, when all is said and done, life is beautiful. Even in the midst of the great evil and the horror and the death that is all around him. 
I really wrestled with this message. It seemed like it was just so easy to path to preach on. But for some reason, I just really wrestled with it. And I came to the conclusion, I want to talk with you about a character in the Old Testament who sought to make life beautiful for the people of Israel. It's not one we tend to associate with it, but I want to look at his life. And though this biblical character circumstance is much different from Guido, this Old Testament character did experience much darkness. His family, in particular, experienced a lot of darkness. So let me just ask you more of a lighthearted note. How many of you come from an imperfect family? <laughs> uh, yeah. I love my family, but I'm a part of it, so I know it's imperfect, okay? Likely, though, your family is not as messy and dark as this biblical character we're going to talk about, Solomon. Solomon, oh, bless his heart, his oldest half-brother, Amnon, raped their half-sister. King David, their father, heard about it and did nothing about it. Amnon then was killed by uh, the second oldest half-brother, Absalom. Absalom, after killing um, Amnon, wanted to be king, wanted to usurp his father, King David, from the throne. Okay. Absalom was killed by David's general, um, I believe Joab. Hmm. David was devastated when Absalom was killed and cries out, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, if only I would have died in your place. Right? Son number three, Adonijah, was very ambitious, and his mother Haggith, which, who was one of the wives of King David, wanted, her, wanted their son Adonijah to be the next king. And what does Adonijah do? And now Adonijah, who, who, whose mother was, was Haggith, put himself forward and said, I will be king. So he got chariots and horses ready uh, with 50 men to run ahead of him. And parenthetically, the writer then writes, his father, was David, had never once reprimanded him by saying, why do you act this way? David was a passive father. I'm sorry, he was. He just wasn't involved in the lives of his kids. And he paid a price. They paid a price. The family paid a price. Solomon was the son of David and Bathsheba, the result of an adulterous relationship. And in fact, David had uh, Bathsheba's husband Uriah put on the front lines of a battle to be sure that Uriah would be killed. David murdered Uriah. David promised Bathsheba that Solomon, their son, would be the next king, but Adonijah had other ideas that he was going to be king. And eventually Solomon does kill Adonijah. So here's a review, just real quickly. Okay. I mean, David's, <laughs> David's son, number one, killed number two. Uh, son number two was killed by David's general, Joab. Son number three, Adonijah, was killed by David's son, Solomon. Okay? Hmm. Anybody's family situation worse than that? <laughs> please, please don't raise your hand. <laughs> mm. I mean, that was the kind of the political family of the day. Was, you know, and politics were bad then, folks. I mean, we complain today, but... Uh. Solomon does become king after David's death. And he was determined to make life beautiful for the people of Israel. Let me explain. He consolidates power. He's young. He's handsome. He's energetic. He's devoted to God. And one day he was going to worship to God. And he has a vision. And God says to Solomon, ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. Imagine God asking you or proclaiming that question to you. Solomon thanks God for his goodness and great kindness and says to God, thank you for making me a servant king. Kind of an interesting way to refer to himself as a servant king. God, he says, Solomon says to God, God, 
being king for these people of Israel, it's too big of a job for me, okay? And he goes on to say, give your servant, that is, give me, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this your great people? What I love here is that he refers to, to helping discern between good and evil. The Hebrew words here for good and evil, good, tobi, uh, literally meaning beautiful, and evil, rach, meaning wretched. Hmm. Solomon's asking God, help me to choose for the people of Israel that which is beautiful. Okay? Okay. God is so pleased saying to Solomon, you know what, you, you, you could have asked for anything when I asked you what you wanted. And you, you, you asked for this discerning heart to determine between what is good and evil and to choose what is beautiful for the people of Israel. Because you did that, because you did that, oh my gosh, Solomon, I'm going to give you the wisdom you're asking for, but Solomon, I'm also, I'm also going to give you glory and honor and power and wealth. Soon after this, two women come to Solomon, and uh, they're, they're prostitutes who never got any justice in that day and age. But they come to Solomon, and both of them claim to be the mother of a baby. They both want custody of the child. And as the story goes, Solomon says, well, look, 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 look. I'll, I'll just cut the baby in half, and each of you take half of it. Okay? And one of them cries out, let, cries out, let my child live. Let the child live. Let, let the other woman have it. I love this. The word live, chai in Hebrew, chai, chai, yeah, they just don't spit on the person in front of you. Chai is derived from two Hebrew letters, chet and yud. In ancient Hebrew, these two letters were symbols for life and beauty. So this woman is saying, my child's life is beautiful. Please save him, King Solomon. Solomon realizes that this woman is a true mother and gives her the child. Solomon, in his wisdom, sides with life's beauty. He is striving in his own way, even in his decision between two prostitutes, to make, proclaim that life is beautiful. The people of Israel, they are so in awe of Solomon. Solomon's wisdom, Scripture says, and, and, and understanding is wider than all the sands of the seashores in this world. His wisdom is greater than, than all the people of the East, the writer says. You know, like Ethan the Ezraite, and He-Man. Yeah, there's one called He-Man. And Calcol, and Darda. And as Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 songs. He knew about plant life from the cedars of Lebanon to the hyssop that grew on the walls. He, and he knew about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. It was one way the writer was just trying to make a case to the world around him that our ruler is greater than your ruler. Okay? Other rulers did come to check out Solomon. Queen, uh, Queen of Sheba came and she was duly impressed. She asked many questions and was very impressed with Solomon's understanding and wisdom and knowledge. With wisdom came great honor, recognition, and power and wealth that Solomon had greater than all the other kings. He had a fleet of trading ships that would return back to port filled with gold and silver and ivory and apes and baboons. Yeah, 1 Kings chapter 10, you can read about that. Unprecedented wealth. I don't know, a ship of baboons. What do you do with that? Anyway, every goblet he had was made of gold. And look at what Solomon ate every day. His, Solomon and his court around him. Now remember as I share this with you, one head of cattle fed over 800 people. Okay. And this is what they, Solomon and his court ate every day. Their daily portion, and this is in 1 Kings chapter 4, their daily portion was 10 head of stall-fed cattle, 20 head of pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep, 100 goats, 
deer, gazelle, roebuck, and choice fowl. No quinoa salad there, okay? No tofu. Definitely not vegetarians. Mm -mm. And the people of Israel were taxed deeply for Solomon and his court to eat this way every day, every day. Kind of odd to call yourself a servant king and live in such a way. Hmm, a little red flag there. Solomon longed to make life beautiful for the people of Israel, though. So he built something that his dad, King David, longed to build, and that was a temple in Jerusalem, a beautiful temple where people could come and worship God, where the Ark of the Covenant that held the Ten Commandments um, would be held and God's presence would be there in this temple. It was an architectural masterpiece, and it took seven years to build. It's beautiful. Help make, you know, uh, the worship beautiful. Help make the city beautiful, the people beautiful. But the very next verse after saying he built this temple and it took seven years, the very next verse, it says that Solomon built his palace. And it took him 13 years to build his palace. He spent almost twice as long building this palace as he did building God's house. Hmm. What's going on here? Solomon showed, I think I have this up here. Solomon showed his love uh, for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, by King David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. There's one word there, except. He followed the instructions of dad, right? Except he offered some sacrifices on high places. This is one way of saying that he worshipped other gods as well. He was embracing idolatry in his life, was King Solomon. He wanted to have life be beautiful for the people of Israel, except... What's your except look like in your life? I'm going to follow Jesus, except... I'm going to worship God with my life, except... That's a great word for all of us, because we're all hypocritical. Mm. Solomon's life was not marked by some great no to God. It was just a little except. Want to love God, except... I have some other things I want to focus on. Hmm. In 1 Kings chapter 11, it's the last chapter we hear about King Solomon in that book in the Old Testament. And we hear about his achievements. And then the writer adds these words. King Solomon loved many foreign women, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, uh, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry uh, with them because they will surely turn your hearts after other gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love, and he had 700 wives and ro of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. That's 1 Kings chapter 11. Kind of an odd cycle here. Wisdom leads to success, which leads to prosperity, which leads to complacency, which leads you away from the very thing that began it all, wisdom. Solomon was very wise, but folks, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, okay? Go figure. He honored the goddess Ashtoreth. He worshipped Ashtoreth, okay, of the Sidonians. She was a mistress of uh, Baal, uh, a pagan god. And to worship Ashtoreth, uh, Solomon would have undertaken what is called sympathetic magic. Okay? That is, you would do things here on earth that would force the gods up above to do the same thing. So in the worship to Ashtoreth, they had temple prostitution. And so uh, the fertility supposedly going on in the temple would make the gods, Ashtoreth up above, make the earth fertile for the crops. Solomon was involved in this worship. He worshipped the god uh, Molech, Moloch, who required child sacrifice. Solomon was involved in this. How did this happen? How did Solomon go this direction? Simple, simple. Solomon gave in to something that eats wisdom for breakfast. You know what that is? <laughs> Desire. 
Desire. I mean, desire can be a good thing, all right? You wake up, you desire to eat. You desire to go to work. You desire to make a difference in this world, right? It, it does, desire can be a good thing. The desire to be beautiful can be life-affirming. And taking into account the movie uh, whose trailer you saw at the beginning, Life is Beautiful, uh, it had me think of this story. Back in 1945, um, some British soldiers um, helped to uh, bring freedom to a German concentration camp called Bergen-Belsen. Okay? And Lieutenant Colonel uh, Mersin Gonin uh, was there among uh, the British soldiers liberating this German concentration camp. And he wrote in his diary, I cannot give adequate description of what I've seen and what I'm seeing. Corpses lying everywhere, huge piles, individuals or couples just lying dead where they fell. He said, we arrived and people still die at 500 people a day. For weeks on end they've been doing this before we can do anything to really try to stop it because they have been so famished, because they have been so destroyed humanly. Children are choking to death from diphtheria when a simple tracheotomy could save them. Women are literally drowning in their own vomit because they are too weak to turn over. People are eating worms while they're holding the piece of bread we gave them because they can't tell the difference. Bodies of children are in dysentery tanks, just lying there. The camp, he writes in his diary, was designed to strip them of their humanity. of any desire to want to be human. The British Red Cross finally arrives with some boxes, and it's a huge quantity of red lipstick. So many other things we needed, hundreds of other things, we get lipstick. Yet it was an act of genius, of sheer unadulterated brilliance. Because women who were sick and in pain, laying in bed, but they would have these scarlet red lips. Women walking around in nothing but blankets, but they had these scarlet red lips. A woman lying on a post-mortem table, dead, clutching a stick of lipstick. And he writes in his diary, at last, someone did something to help these people reclaim their desire to be human, their desire to be beautiful. Desire, though, has a dark side, okay? That can be obsessive. I mean, more of a lighthearted way, because oh, I, I just get so heavy here. And, uh. It's like a child desiring a donut. Mom, I want that donut. I want it now, right? It'll make me happy. I'm going to have a tantrum, you know? You give me that donut, I will never ask for anything else in the rest of my life, I promise. Just give me that donut, Mom. Until I get my heart's desire. You obsess about it. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about how we, we, we need to be careful of deceitful desires because it's, it's like you, you see something that's going to bring joy to your heart and true happiness and it's deceiving you. Be careful with desire. Love, love, true love hmm. ought to desire the good for others. But often we confuse love with desire. Okay? Sometimes we say we love what we desire. Let me show you this famous commercial. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to be an Oscar Mayer wiener. That is what I truly like to be. Because if I were an Oscar Mayer wiener, everyone would be in love with me. Really? Really? You want to be a hot dog? It's one of the dumbest songs in the world, but we all know it. I mean, if you were a hot dog, even if you're a really good one, people aren't in love with you. They're just going to devour you. Okay? You don't throw someone you love on the grill and burn them. Okay? You don't longitudinally cut them, slice them in half. You don't smear them with mustard, throw them on a bun, and devour them. Okay? That's not love. That's desire. Wish I had a hot dog. 
Costco is pretty good. Um, desire is give me what I want now, right? But to have such desire, we have to push out other thoughts that try to get into our mind. A really smart, rich, and powerful guy just died a couple weeks ago in prison. Apparently took his life. Disgraced by how he handled sexual desire. I promise you, that desire, to hold on to that desire, he had to keep out hundreds of other thoughts out of his mind that could have saved him. That power, though, that potential, that force of desire, we are capable of, of letting desire take hold of our lives. So wisdom or desire? Hmm. Which will you design your life around? Wisdom asks, what's, what's good for others? What makes life beautiful for others? Desire well, it tends to narrow your focus onto you. Guido, in the movie, he took a stand to devote his life to a life of wisdom that saw to it that he would make life beautiful for his five-year-old son in that concentration camp. Solomon started out seeking wisdom, right? But it didn't end well. I'm sorry, you cannot love 700 wives. You just can't. They become objects of desire. That desire kept him from thinking the thoughts that he should have thought. What is this way of life doing to me? What is it doing to my relationship with God? What is it doing to the people of Israel? What is it doing to the children? What is it doing to these women? He had to push all that out. He died a foolish old man. Centuries later, one would come along and say this. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. Who said that? Jesus. Yeah, whenever a pastor asks a question about who it is, usually Jesus is a good answer. Okay? Um, yeah, and the people heard this. What they were holding on to was Solomon's wealth and power. And Jesus is saying, Someone's greater? You're referring to yourself, Jesus? I don't think so. You're a homeless, itinerant rabbi. You're penniless. Solomon had a palace that it, it, he took 13 years to build. Almost twice as long as the temple in Jerusalem. It, Solomon had, had this beautiful palace. He had ships of, filled with gold, of, with baboons and apes. Yeah. Really? You, Jesus? They would have laughed at him. It was a joke. How can you be greater than Solomon? And Jesus goes on to say elsewhere, consider, if you will, Jesus talked about wisdom. Consider the lilies and beauty in life. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not. Neither do they spin. It has say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Life is beautiful, folks. But like Solomon, we can so easily go astray. Word of warning. If you do follow the wisdom of Jesus, the world very likely will tend to see you as foolish. Because you will live a life where your focus is on, on making life better and more beautiful for those around you. Your life will not be focused on your 401k or your beautiful home, or your clothes, or your vacations. The world gave Jesus a cross for his wisdom. Guido in the movie was viewed as a fool with a few screws loose. But he was doing everything he could to, to make life beautiful for his son in the midst of death and darkness. Neither of these examples you know, Jesus or in the movie Guido, none of them cared about how the world saw him, okay? Love drove both of them. Jesus' love for the human family, Guido's love for his wife and young child. 
and nothing, not even the horror of a concentration camp, kept Guido from building within the heart of his five-year-old son the belief that life, when all is said and done, is, is beautiful. <clears throat> and it's that kind of spirit, I think, that enables us to look at the cross and see a symbol of beauty, blood-stained and all. I'm going to end with this story. I don't know why these things sometimes happen to me, but they do. Um, I was running early Wednesday morning <clears throat> on Middleton Road here in Nampa, and I was actually just heading towards Iowa. I wasn't very far. And um, I saw something else the occasion when I'm running, uh, an animal in the road. You know, if I see a squirrel or whatever, I'll go and I'll take it off the road. I just cannot have the heart to see that creation of God continue to be run over by cars or whatever. I just can't. So I'll, I'll pull them off to the side. Well, there was a bird in front of me. It was on the, the, right along the shoulder of the road. And um, I almost passed it because it was blending in with the ground. But then I, I looked at it and... And it realized, so I, I picked it up by its feet, began to, but it fluttered a little. I thought, oh, it's still alive. Ugh. So I, 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 I reached down with both my hands. I thought, I'm bound to be pecked. And it was a quail. It was a quail. Okay. And I picked it up in both my hands and took it to the yard that was right there to lay it down in the shade. And the grass was still wet from the sprinkler. I thought, well, you know, just for it to, rather than be on the gravel here, and I just wanted, I, so I put it over there. And I mean, there's, there's a picture of a quail, okay? They're beautiful creatures. And I, it was there, and I was down on my knees, and um, its eyes were looking around a little, and then I just began to caress its head in that little doohickey thing that hangs out in front of it. And I was just looking, I was just amazed by its beauty. I never really looked at the quail this closely before. I felt so bad for it. I mean, it, it wasn't blood. It was just, it obviously was just said internal injuries. I kept, and when I'd caress it, its eyes would close. And then I would stop and it opened its eyes again, look around. And I would caress it. And I was probably there for 10 or 15 minutes doing this, you know. You know, and then the owner of the house comes out and says, what am I doing? Yeah, I get it, you know. <laughs> I said, well, a quail been hit, and I just put it over here. He walks over there, and he picks up the quail, and he says, another damn quail. And he throws it into the garbage can that was on the side of the road. And I'm still on my knees, because it happens so quickly. He was just like, oh, another damn quail. So I got up, and he started walking back towards his house. And I walked over to the garbage can, and I got the quail out. I didn't say it, but I was thinking it. Another damn human being. I know saying it and thinking it's just as bad as, as far as my heart condition is with God, so I confess it. But that's what I thought. How do we get so darn callous? with life around us. What's happening to us? We take sides against each other. We fight. We ignore people that don't believe the way we believe. We demean. I mean, have you ever seen the beauty of a quail? Oh my gosh. They are beautiful animals. Now think of the Holocaust. Slavery within this nation. Hatred towards people of color and people of different religions. And there's that whole attitude, just toss them away. Toss them out of here. Into the garbage, whatever. Another damn human being who's not like me. And what are we doing with this environment of ours? Another damn glacier just melts, whatever. Move on with life. 
enough. Have, have we just lost sight that life is beautiful? I think we have. Because we're driven by desire, desire to protect what's ours, whatever ours is, when everything we have is God's. Seek that wisdom that is compelled to want to make life beautiful for others. And you may find it's something as simple as giving a, a stick of lipstick to someone. Other moments you'll probably be seen as, as a crazy man kneeling on a front lawn of a stranger, caressing the head of a, of a, of a quail and that little doohickey thing. <laughs> Trying to just offer some peace to this creature in its last breaths. So yeah, to end the story, I took the quail and I walked with it and held it in my, my hand, just looking at it. And while I was holding it, it, it took its last breath. And I um, buried it along Iowa, once again in some shade, among some cedars. I don't know. I don't have the answer. I just, I just know how Jesus lived his life. And um, I think we have a great challenge before us. What, what will we choose this day to walk in the wisdom of Jesus and try to make life beautiful as best we can, even in the midst of great darkness and perhaps be seen as a fool? Or will we simply choose our human desire? Each of you have the freedom to choose. Almighty God, as we come before you in your house, we do ask for wisdom, but, oh my gosh, if we truly give expression to that wisdom and clarity of mind and desire to make life beautiful, it's not going to set well with the way the world around us works often. So we need, we need support here, God. We need help. We need strength. We need courage. We need, we need, we need, we need. But may our needs be a desire to glorify you. May that be the healthy kind of desire that we hold within our hearts that's not obsessive about us, but is obsessive, if we're going to be obsessed, to be obsessed with you, the great obsession. We're here, and we all, we all at some level have expressed our love to you. And we want to be able to take that love and have it Somehow, some way, lay seeds of beauty in this world. Because when all is said and done, life is beautiful. Amen. Okay, let's stand. Stretch those bones of yours. We're going to sing, He Touched Me.